Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. Normally, when I ask scholars about their experience with the OI, they tell me how much the Institute helped them discover more about early American history. They received this help in the form of one of the OI's fellowships, editorial assistance from its publishing program, or from conversations sparked by Institute-sponsored conferences and seminars. But David Shields told me the most remarkable story yet. He told me how his experiences with the Omohundro Institute, both as an undergraduate at the College of William and Mary and as a more senior scholar, taught him how to think about history and use historical sources in ways that have helped him influence our present day environment and eating patterns. I'm kind of a child of the Omohundro Institute. I did my undergraduate work at William and Mary and Studying at Williamsburg gives people interested in early America a variety of ways of getting into things. And while I was certainly working in the print archives, I was also working as a field excavator for the Virginia Association for the Preservation of Antiquities. And one of the things that digging for artifacts did and engaging in the sort of thinking about material culture that is so evident in Williamsburg and has been part of the conversation that the Omohundro Institute has always been about is that it made me think differently about the ways to conceive the study of text. One of the things which is unusual about my career as a scholar is that I've never limited myself to six inches of a library shelf. One of the things that I discovered is that the way that I conduct research, the pursuit of kind of total history, incorporating lots of sources, giving the density of other voices into the mix that you offer when you publish a book was something that I could take. I'm one of the most significant people in the revitalization of Southern cuisine from the agricultural end. I had the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation that brought back Carolina Gold Rice and several dozen other key ingredients of Southern cooking. We had to understand what the growing system was that produced the famous cuisines of the 19th century and early 20th century. And in order to bring back those land race grains and heirloom vegetables, we had to know how the system worked, how it was used, the various ethnographic backgrounds of Southern cuisine and Southern agriculture. And as a result, we have in the fields a multitude of ingredients that have not been grown in a while. We couldn't have done that if I hadn't have learned how to do systematic research, taking a look at every sort of evidence in order to reconstruct a scene. And that's something that was a legacy of my training under the guidance of the Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 84 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. What do historians do with historical sources? How do they read and interpret them for information about the past? In episode 79, Jim Horn took us on a tour of historic Jamestown, and he told us all about the historical sources historians have used to interpret its past. But while he told us what historical sources are, we didn't have time to discuss how to read them. So today, in the fifth installment of our Doing History, How Historians Work series, we're going to investigate how historians read and interpret historical sources. And as you often ask me questions about how everyday people lived, we're going to explore how historians read historical sources by using the documents and objects everyday people left behind. Zara Annis Hanslin, an assistant professor of history at Cooney's College of Staten Island and an expert at reading all types of historical sources, will serve as our guide for this exploration. During our tour, Zara reveals what historians mean when they talk about primary and secondary historical sources, how historians read and interpret primary sources for information, and details about the lives of four everyday people who lived during the 18th century, Anne Shippen Willing, Robert Feek, Anna Maria Garthwaite, and Luke Sweetland. Are you ready to meet our everyday people and discover more about how reading and interpreting historical sources allows historians to know what they know about the past? Let's go welcome our guest historian. <music> 
with tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past. Here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at Cooney's College of Staten Island. This summer, she will join the faculty of the University of Delaware, where she will further her study of early American history, Atlantic history, and material culture. She is the author of the forthcoming book, Portrait of a Woman in Silk, Hidden Histories of the British Atlantic World. And today she joins us as part of our Doing History, How Historians Work series to reveal how historians read primary historical sources. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Zara Annis Hanslin. Thank you, Liz, and thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of the podcast, so it's a real pleasure to be part of it. Thanks, Zara. We're excited to have you with us. Now, you study the culture and everyday lives of early Americans primarily through what historians call material culture. Would you tell us what historians mean by material culture? Material culture is, on its most basic level, sort of a fancy phrase for things or objects, things of the past called artifacts. And beyond those things itself, beyond the material culture, it's also the idea that you can understand people in the larger society or culture in which we live through the study of the objects of the material things that people make, buy, and use. So the idea that things are sort of a way to understand lives in the past. If you look around the room in which you're sitting, for example, chances are something in that room tells us something about you and the larger world in which you live. I'm surrounded by history books and computer components. <laughs> and that probably tells us a lot about the world in which you live. Absolutely. <laughs> I have a lot of coffee mugs with the names of places where I've had research fellowships and studied history. And that also tells people a lot about me. Historians like to classify historical sources or all of the information they use to research and learn more about the past. And they divide historical sources into two categories, primary and secondary historical sources. Zara, would you tell us how historians define these different types of sources? Primary sources are the sources that are created by people directly involved in an event. They're sort of like the eyewitnesses of history. So something like a letter or a diary entry describing something that someone actually saw or experienced. By contrast, a secondary source is usually what we would think of as a history book, although recently there's also been a rather famous Broadway musical that might be considered a secondary source that is created by people who weren't themselves eyewitnesses to the event that occurred, but who are using primary sources to describe interpret and analyze the significance of the event itself. So where does material culture, the objects that people used in their everyday lives, fit into this spectrum of historical sources? That is such a great question because it has a very tricky answer. And material objects can be classified, I think, as both. And the sort of hedgy answer is it depends on the context. So to take an example related to Ben Franklin, someone with whom you're highly familiar, if you look at a material thing that he owned, so say a suit that he owned, and some do survive, you can look at that definitely as a primary source. You can look at the fabric and the shape and the cut, the measurements of it, and you can find out things like how tall he was, how fat he was, what kind of clothing he looked like to buy, what type of event he might have been going to based on the level of formality of the suit, etc. On the other hand, if you consider a portrait of Benjamin Franklin wearing clothes, that portrait itself could either be seen as a primary source that gives you information about the point of view of the artist who created it or the organization that commissioned the painting, or it could be looked at as a secondary source, as something that is completely interpretive imagination of the artist rather than an actual reflection of a piece of clothing, for example, that he would have owned. There are portraits in which Benjamin Franklin is wearing imaginary robes that he never physically owned. And in that case, that would be a secondary source. It's funny that you should bring up portraits. (laughs) Zara's forthcoming book, Portrait of a Woman in Silk, begins with the portrait of an early American woman in silk. Zara uses this portrait as a way to explore the lives of all the people who labored to create the portrait and at the lives of the thousands of people who also produced and consumed objects around the Atlantic world during the 18th century. Zara, would you tell us about the portrait of the woman in silk and why it attracted your eye? I'd love to. This portrait hangs at the Winterthur Museum in Delaware. And initially, it looks as though it's actually just a very lovely example of typical 18th century colonial painting. It seems to fit perfectly where it's placed, which is above some sort of high-end, lovely wooden furniture from mid-18th century Philadelphia. And it's, in fact, a portrait of a Philadelphia woman named Anne Shippen Willing. So it's eye-catching in a sort of general sense in that it's a pretty portrait. It shows a woman wearing this silk dress of a flowered pattern, and the painter himself is pretty skilled. It's got a nice shine to it. She has a very sweet face, rosy cheeks. She looks like someone who's appealing that you might 
might want to know. I will be honest and say that one of the things that most people notice immediately is that she has a very large bosom. And this actually, she comes by honestly because she is the mother of 11 children. But other than that, the eye-catching bit is the dress itself that she wears because that is a somewhat unusual element of a colonial portrait of this type and time period. So most colonial women didn't go around town wearing silk. That is very true. Most colonial women didn't even have portraits painted, much less wearing silk. But what's unusual about this is not that it's silk itself, but that it's a patterned silk. So in other words, that it has a damask pattern, this pattern of flowers. And most people who had portraits painted had their portraits painted wearing very plain, single color dresses. And this is both because it's a lot easier for the painter to just paint a solid color. And also because in the 18th century, what dated a fabric or an outfit was not the way it was cut. So it wasn't like pants today. We can assume that if it's bell bottoms, it might be from the 60s or 70s. It's not that type of dating. It's the type of dating in which the pattern itself, the flower in this case, would have immediately identified to those seeing it at the time, whether it was five or 10 or 20 years out of fashion. And so most people who were investing the money to have their portraits painted wanted a more timeless look. So they chose a plain fabric. But this woman, Anne Ship and Willing, this Philadelphia colonist, chose to have her portrait painted in this very distinctive, very boldly flowered piece of silk. What I find fascinating about this is if many of us came across Robert Feek's portrait of Anne Ship and Willing, we would see the portrait of a seemingly wealthy woman in a floral pattern dress. But you, you saw something more. You saw a primary historical source. What information or hints of information about history were you able to see or glean just by looking at Feek's painting? That's such a great way to approach the question the way you asked it, because initially at first, of course, when I first saw it, I thought what every other historian who's looked at it has thought that, you know, what a relatively lovely example of a colonial woman showing her likeness, having her face captured for posterity and showing that she really likes to buy these nice British things like silk, like all American colonists in the mid 18th century. But then once I started looking more carefully at it, I realized that you don't have to dig too deep to realize that the portrait from just what's on the canvas itself gives you a couple of really good primary source materials with which to work. And one is that aside from the woman herself, who is chronicled because of the provenance of the portrait of how it descended through the family, who is chronicled as being undoubtedly identified as Anne Ship and Willing. And that is unusual. Sometimes we don't know who the subjects of these colonial portraits are. They're just portrait of a woman or portrait of a man, portrait of an unknown child. But in this case, we know that it's Anne Ship and Willing, who is from two very important Philadelphia families. So in her own self is important. But also, again, rather unusually, on the painting, one of her hands is pointing to a signature left by the artist, and it reads very simply, R. Feek Pinks. 1746. Now, this is unusual because a lot of colonial painters did not sign their portraits, and Feek only signed about 11 of his 60 or so that are known to be by him that survive. So this in and of itself is unusual, and it's a nice bit of archival information, not just because it tells us that Robert Feek painted the portrait, but because he himself is this very mysterious figure. He's the son of a Baptist minister from Oyster Bay, Long Island, who very improbably goes on to become one of the most sought-after painters to the great and the good of Newport, Rhode Island, Boston, Philadelphia. And we don't even know when he died. He sails away towards either Bermuda or Barbados and die sometime between 1751 and 52. So this is actually a really valuable bit of information about this very mysterious man as well. So immediately, just by looking at the canvas and what's painted on it, we have these two lives who are undeniably identified and linked together through this object. And there's a third life connected to this portrait, too. Anna Maria Garthwaite stands as one of the people who labored to create Willing's portrait. Would you tell us about Garthwaite and her role in producing Willing's portrait? Garthwaite is a great example of why scholars who do material culture research also rely very heavily, like any other historian, on traditional archival sources. And that is because the pattern on the fabric itself is what tells us that Anna Maria Garthwaite is a third person involved in the creation of this portrait of a woman in silk. Now, this isn't immediately obvious. It's not as though Anne Ship and Willing wrote down the name of the designer of this silk or the fact that this woman was related to it. But because Anne Maria Garthwaite has a collection of designs that survive, I was able to pinpoint the fact that she is, in fact, the designer of this silk. And Anne Maria Garthwaite is, like Robert Feek, somewhat unusual and mysterious. She was one of the few women silk designers who worked in 18th century England. This in of itself would make her sort of worthy of historical note. She's also a woman of mystery. She was born in 1688, so the year of the Glorious 
Revolution in England. She was born in Lincolnshire. She's the daughter of a very well-connected, with connections to the English nobility, Anglican minister, and she's well-educated, she's literate. But for some reason, we don't know why to this day, in her early 40s, she picked up from York, where she had been living, and moved to the East End neighborhood of Spitalfields in London, and very improbably began this very prolific, very successful career designing silk. And it turns out that she is, in fact, the one who designed the pattern that is the basis for the fabric that Anne Ship and Willing wears in her portrait. Did Anne Ship and Willing know of Garth Waite's work and commission the silk design from her, or did she come by the silk in a different way? One of the really interesting things about the connections of the lives in this portrait is that two of them know one another and two of them do not. So Robert Feek and Anne Ship and Willing obviously knew each other, spent hours together in a room while she was standing for her portrait and he was painting it. At the same time, on the other side of the Atlantic, the designer, Anna Maria Garthwaite, and the weaver who wove the silk certainly knew one another, and they also had a long history of repeated business transactions and went to the same church. So chances are they knew one another, at least slightly socially as well. However, the Londoners and the colonials didn't know one another. And because the silk, unlike the portrait, doesn't have a label of a signature of Anna Maria Garthwaite designer, Anne Shippen Willing would have had no way of knowing that this silk was designed by one of England's few early modern women silk designers. You mentioned that there was no signature or label on the silk that said Anna Maria Garthwaite designed the pattern. So how did you know that it was Anna Maria Garthwaite who designed the silk in Willing's portrait? This is one of those moments of sort of research serendipity. And I often tell my students that sometimes I think it's just important to physically go to an archive or physically go to a museum and just immerse yourself in whatever's there, because chances are you will have a eureka moment that you're not expecting. And sometimes these unexpected moments are the most fantastic ones. And in this case, when I was still in graduate school, I was in London and I was on a research trip. I was at the Victorian Albert Museum and the Victorian Albert Museum has this fantastic textile study room. You can go stand and flip through these glass encased examples of 18th century English silks. And that's what I was doing. And I was sort of flipping through silk after silk, silk after silk. And a lot of them looked so familiar to me. And I had this nagging feeling. I thought, why do these look so familiar to me? And I left the room, went and had some tea, which is also an inspirational thing to do. And when I came back to the library at that point, I thought, aha, this reminds me of that silk in that portrait at Winterthur of the woman from Philadelphia with the flowered silk. And in fact, what I found after a little bit of digging that afternoon in the library at the v was a curator at the Victorian Albert Museum named Natalie Rothstein years ago had discovered that in fact, the fabric worn in the Feek portrait was designed by Anna Maria Garthwaite. And so I went, looked at the design itself, which survives at the Victorian Albert Museum. And when I looked at that design, I got yet more information about the past that I could apply to my analysis of the portrait. Like Zara used her portrait of a woman in silk as a window into history, we're going to use Anna Maria Garthwaite as a window into how historians use and interpret historical sources. But before we explore specific examples of how Zara uses documents, objects, and visual sources to learn how early Americans lived, Zara, would you tell us what historians mean when they say that they read historical sources? When historians say they read, it's more than the simple act of just looking at and understanding words on the page, or in this case, paint on the canvas or drawing on a piece of paper. It's also an act of interpretation and analysis. So how do you read historical sources? Do you have a process or perhaps processes that you go through when you read the different types of primary sources that you use in your historical research? I do have a general process and I sort of adopt a persona as my first step, and that is to adopt the persona of a historical detective. And I say that because I find it very useful when analyzing a source, a historical source, to think like a detective would, to think what evidence is there on the page or on the canvas that is obvious to the eye, and what is it that's missing, what's absent. And I often think of the famous Sherlock Holmes story in which he talks about the curious incident of the dog in the night. You know, he helps solve this murder mystery partly by finding tracks of a missing horse and footprints of a man in the soil. So that's the obvious thing that's in the evidence, right? But at the same time, you know, Sherlock Holmes identifies what's missing. The Scotland Yard detective says, is there anything else to which you'd like to draw my attention? And Holmes says, to the curious incident of the dog in the night. And the Scotland Yard detective says, well, the dog did nothing in the night. And Holmes says, exactly, that was the curious incident. So in other words, what is the source not telling us? Because sometimes what is absent is just as important as what is present. And I think in the case of this portrait of a woman in silk, what was really fascinating was It's interesting enough what's visible on the canvas, the fact that you have these two colonial lives linked together and this history of colonial consumption 
consumption of British goods. But what's underneath the surface? What's absent? What's the sort of dog in the night in this portrait? And once I started digging into what lurks below the surface, the hidden histories of it, that's when things got really interesting and layered. It sounds like words on a page can answer questions that you had when you started to read your source, but what is absent from those words can actually leave you with more historical questions than when you started reading. Yes, that's very true. And, you know, sometimes things in the past are just unknowable, as you know, and I don't have to tell you, right? Some mysteries are not solvable. But in this case, for example, once I solved the first mystery of, yes, this was a design by Anna Maria Garthwaite, when I went and looked at the design itself, she had this very precise, lovely for historian habit of recording the date the design was commissioned and the name of the person who commissioned it. So right away, I knew that the design was drawn by Garthwaite in 1743 and that a man named Simon Julian had bought it from her. And so my next immediate question, of course, was, well, I know nothing about this Simon Julen character, so I better start digging into him. And what I found looking him up is that he's another one of these fairly enigmatic people, doesn't leave a lot of traditional written sources behind, no diary, no journals, et cetera, et cetera. But he was a member of a guild of the London Weavers Guild. And so there are records related to that. He's French Huguenot. So I was able to parse out larger histories of the French Huguenot population in London and their importance in the silk industry. And also just the very basic fact of now I knew that it took three years time for Garthwaite to design this silk in London, for it to get woven by Simon Julen in his shop and for it to make its way across the Atlantic and then be chronicled in this portrait. And so it's a pretty amazing group of bits of information that together paint this larger transatlantic picture in this case. And it's partly by following up on the question of what is not immediately obvious in the source, what is absent. And once I find what's absent, what can I uncover? Let's look at a few specific examples of how Zara reads primary sources. Anna Maria Garthwaite left few documents about her life, but she left a will. Zara, would you tell us about Garthwaite's will and how you read this document for information about her life? I'm so glad that you asked me about this because one of the things that I found with researching this book is that Anne Maria Garthwaite, like the other three people involved in crafting this portrait of a woman in silk, is a perfect example of someone who, by all measures, should have left lots of documentation behind. Each of these four people was literate, educated, financially secure, the type of people you would think would leave letters or diaries or some type of written source that we could use to unpack their lives. But in fact, what we find is that none of them left much more than a will, for example. And in some cases, Robert Feek, the painter, didn't even leave that. So when I was researching, it was a really great reminder of how historians have to have a sort of really tenacious ability to really chew onto a short historical source and get everything out of it that you possibly can. And in the case of her will, I did find that you could look at it and gain some, not just basic information such as when she wrote it, when she died, where she went to church, where she lived, but also read into it more personal bits of information such as who were the people, the family and friends that she cared about? Which organizations did she care about? What did she own? How much money did she have? And it even tells you a little bit about her personality. So you can really read much more into it than is on the surface. One thing that Zara read into her will is that Anna Maria Garthwaite valued female independence. Zara, I'm willing to bet that nowhere in Garthwaite's will does it state that she values female independence. So would you describe what information contained in Garthwaite's will allows us to draw this conclusion? Uh, Yes, you're absolutely right. And if you'd placed that bet, you'd be a winner. I wish that it did come out and say something so succinctly helpful, but obviously it does not. However, there are a few bequests that she makes, some gifts, and then also some sort of unusual clauses in the will that you can read into and understand that she is this single career woman in the 18th century who wants to protect the women in her life that she cares about. The first clue is that she mentions her sister. She lived with a widowed sister in London and they had a ward, a young girl who was left with them when her parents died when she was very small. And her concern in this will is that her widowed sister and their ward, this young girl, are left financially secure. And this is in contrast to her widowed sister's will in which she is more concerned about putting the Garthwaite name forward for posterity. And so she leaves much of the money to a male cousin so to sort of further the Garthwaite family name. And this is not uncommon, right, in a system in which there's primogeniture and inheritance is privileged by males rather than females. But in the case of Anna Maria Garthwaite, she bypasses the male cousin entirely and just talks about her sister and their ward, this young girl. And the other thing that's in there that is really interesting is that she leaves bequests to a friend. And she specifically notes that this female friend is to be given this money and that her husband is not to have 
have any say, control, or access to it whatsoever unless the female friend so wishes. And this is a little bit unusual and a very pointed commentary on how women often lost control of their money when they were married in the 18th century. That's that principle of coverture, right? Yes, exactly. The concept of the femme covert or the covered woman in legal terms. Yes. And so she was obviously trying to buy step that a bit. Although Garthwaite left little by way of a paper record about her life, she did leave behind a trove of material and visual sources, including more than 800 watercolor designs. Zara, would you tell us about these designs? Yes, her designs are just fantastic. To go and look through them all is sort of like an amazing visual walk through a woman's life. I've come to think of them as sort of like her diary because she did not leave a diary, although I've wished I can't even tell you how many times that she had. But I see these designs as sort of a diary, not just of her career, but also of her aesthetic interest and her development as an artist. Because of course, in the 18th century, a silk designer wouldn't have been seen as an artist the way we think of an artist. They would have been seen as a craftsperson as an artisan, as someone who made their living doing this sort of skilled but mechanical industry, not an artistic one. But in this case, I think you can read a lot into this diary. And they are a wide range of designs. Some are black and white, some are in color. They're of all different sizes. They're commissioned. She worked from 1730 to the 1760s, but really 1730 to early 50s was her flourishing time period. So a few decades. And you get lots of information about who's in the silk industry, who's commissioning these designs, who's buying them from her. And you also get a sense of how she trained herself to become a better designer. And you also can see what she liked aesthetically speaking. So which flowers appealed to her. She really liked magnolias and lilies and aloes and roses. And she also liked to portray these flowers sometimes in a very Asian inspired way, almost like chintz patterns or calicos that such as would have been brought to the colonies by the East India Company. But sometimes she has really naturalistic, almost like their botanical drawings in her designs. And so you can really see how her brain is working as well as her hand by looking at this diary of her designs. What strikes me here is that you talk about Garthwaite's watercolors like you talk about her written will, like they are full of information about her past. In fact, you called her designs a diary. Would you help us see the historical information that you see embedded within Garthwaite's designs? Perhaps you could even describe one of Garthwaite's watercolors for us and tell us how you read it like a source. One of my favorite of her designs is not the one in the portrait, but it was done the same year, also in 1743. And it is a design that was commissioned by a man named Mr. Gobi. And this is an important bit of information because he shows up in the archival record quite a bit. He was a high-ranking official in the Weaver's Guild. He was a fairly well-off master weaver himself, and he was a French Huguenot. And looking at the information of when this design was made and for whom gives some critical information, when you couple that with what the design itself is, then you get a really big picture history just out of this single design. And that's because this design, visually speaking, and Garthwaite in her index for that year referred to it as an aloe design. It's a repeating design of wonderfully curling, realistic aloe leaves from which English roses are sort of growing. So obviously, no one has ever gone to a garden and see a rose growing out of an aloe plant. This is not naturalistically possible, but the flowers themselves are rendered so naturalistically, it looks like a botanical drawing, like something that a man of science would make in the 18th century. And how you can read this design as a bit of global history, I think is really fascinating because the aloe at this point in time only was in England because it was imported from Afro-Caribbean sources. It's not grown naturally in England. Anyone who's spent time in England knows that it doesn't have the climate to grow aloe as well. And at this point, it was grown only in greenhouses. So it was this really exotic plant that symbolized global trade and this global fascination that people in the 18th century had with botanicals and with exotic plants. And we tend to associate that with networks of men. So the type of men who would be in the American Philosophical Society or the Royal Society of London. But if you look at this design, a couple things sort of shift our preconceptions about that. And one is that this shows us how deeply women were embedded in these scientific networks as well. Here's a woman designer designing these very, not physically possible specimens, but very precisely, accurately depicted on the page of aloes. And it also shows, I think, that there was a demand for this among women consumers because this would have been made into a dress. This would have been worn by a woman as a way possibly to show that she too was interested in aloes and these exotic plants and these botanicals. And then if you think about who's commissioning it, this Mr. Gobi, 
this French Huguenot figure of importance in the London silk industry, I think it really points as well to what Garthwaite is doing politically speaking. And that is that she is using fashion as a way to sort of give Britain the superiority over the French rivals. Because in the mid 18th century, in addition to fighting actual wars on the ground, the British and the French fought a sort of war of style and it was fought through silk designs. And so these French Huguenot men like Mr. Gobi gained this importance because they were symbolically French, but they weren't actually French and they were Protestants. So they could stand as symbolic counterpoint to French Catholics. And Garthwaite was held up by her contemporaries as a woman who really embodied how Britons could be superior to the French, in this case, through their silk design. And so this single design, I think, shows you so many wonderful things about the larger world in which Garthwaite and the British Empire are operating. And it's just a fantastic bit of evidence to be unpacked. Do we know if anyone in England used or wore Garthwaite's aloe rose design? Yes. Actually, what's really interesting about this Spitalfield silk, as it's called, flowered silk that Garthwaite designed, is that the two major markets for it, one was London and the other was the North American colonies. It also went as far afield as Scandinavia, the Caribbean, you know, all over the British Atlantic world, really. But this really is a story in some ways in which the metropolitan center of London and then the colonial periphery of North America are the key consumers here, the key sort of financial players. And so it would have been worn just as likely in London as in the colonies. And we do know that sometimes people commissioned Spitalfield silk, flowered silk, and asked very specifically for the designs to make pointed either political, economic, or scientific aesthetic statements. There's a wonderful example of a silk that was worn by the daughter of a London mayor in the early 1750s. And this was a man who earned his money Money making beer. He was a, a brewmaster in London. And so his daughter, who served as his hostess, his wife being dead, served as his hostess at the events to celebrate his inauguration as mayor of London, wore this Spitalfield silk that was decorated with images of barley and hops to sort of pay homage to the fact that the family had made their money in beer. And so obviously the message that is being sent by wearing an aloe is slightly different than the message being sent by wearing barley and hops. But I think you can easily see the point here, right? That it's the symbolism of what is decorating the silk that is noticeable and commented upon. And in fact, in newspaper accounts of these mayoral celebrations, it was what was on her dress was remarked upon. The symbolism is fascinating because we read history books that often talk about how the metropole influenced the colonies. And yet aloe was clearly a colonial plant being worn on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. So Zara, it sounds like Americans helped to determine what was fashionable in England, just as much as Englishmen and women influenced what was fashionable in the colonies. Yes, absolutely. And that was one of the really important, historiographically speaking, things that came out of this research, which was that Garthwaite's designs rely extraordinarily heavily upon these plants that are either from the colonies or are propagated and sent to London by colonists such as John Bartram and that are grown in places like the Chelsea Physic Garden, which Garthwaite had access to because of her family connections. But this really vivid picture of the fact that colonial plants and colonial scientists, men and women on the ground are sort of driving the fashion that's being designed in London. And also, too, that colonial consumers who have potentially no interest in botanical networks whatsoever are also driving this. And in Garthwaite's designs, you see very pointed notations of what colors certain elements should be. Her designs are often multicolored. And some of the colors are very much colors that are much more popular in the colonies than in London. And in fact, one of those is this color that we would think of as khaki or taupe, but that at the time they called cloth. And that in fact is exactly the color that Anne Shippen Willing is wearing in her portrait. So it's actually really interesting that what Willing is wearing in her portrait would have been one of the most popular colonial consumer choices that Anna Maria Garthwaite would have been designing with that in mind, you know, wanting to sell her design to weavers and silk merchants who wanted to buy it, but that we don't necessarily understand this unless we start looking at the push and pull between the colonies and the metropole, rather than assuming that the fashion and the science are trickling one way across the ocean, rather than this sort of swirling connection. Now that we know how you read primary sources, perhaps you can tell us what happens when two or more different sources contain conflicting information. During your research, have you ever come across any sources that contained conflicting information? And if so, how did you resolve the conflict? That's such a great question. And of course, this is always something that can be a little heart stopping for a historian when you think that you found this answer to a historical mystery, and then suddenly you come across the heart stopping information that perhaps your interpretation is wrong. There were a couple of times where I had to circle back and follow things to various trails, things in which people dissembled in letters. And then looking at the account of what happened at the event, it was clear that their letters were just sort of dissembling when I was researching the project for the Portrait of a Woman in Silk. But what's the most dramatic 
dramatic by far example that I found of this is actually something that I've come across while researching my second project on the American Revolution. And that is another material artifact. I think it's appropriate to discuss it here. And that is something that's at the Huntington Library that is a note that is alleged to be written on human skin. It's less than a foot in size. It's not very large. And it's sort of a ragged piece of parchment to the appearance. But written on this piece of parchment, it says, this is the skin of a white man and goes on to describe how this man was tortured and killed in very detailed grisly fashion by Native Americans, then says that it's being written by someone who is with Sullivan's army, that a hundred of the men there have died, that they're on their way to Albany. And then he ends very enigmatically by saying, if we keep our skin, which is either just a really poor joke or an unknowing illusion, I'm not sure. And then he signs his name, Luke Sweetland, and the date, September 1779. Now, what's interesting about this, other than the fact that it's just inherently interesting because it says it's a note written on human skin, is that scientifically speaking, we don't know whether this is actually human skin. It could be a piece of parchment made of you know, calf skin or pig skin or something other than human skin. But the fact that it says that that is what it is, of course, gives you a sort of different interpretation on what you're holding in your hand when you are analyzing it as a source. When I did a little bit of digging on this, because of course you find a note on human skin in the archives, you're going to follow up on it. I did a little bit of digging and it turns out that the name attached to the note, Luke Sweet is an actual historical person who was captured by the Seneca and then adopted by them, lived with them for over a year, right before Sullivan's campaign commenced in 1779 in Iroquois, what's now upstate New York. And this man left behind some captivity narratives. And what's interesting is when you read the captivity narratives, it's very clear that he actually, although he wanted to get back to his white family, he was treated very kindly by the Seneca. And in fact, the people who didn't treat him kindly were Sullivan's army when they found him. He looked like an Indian. They weren't sure whether he was a loyalist or an Indian. And so they beat him and then they forced him to guide the army through the rest of the campaign since he had a passing familiarity with Iroquois that most of them did not have. So then the question becomes, did he actually write this note on what is allegedly human skin that is seemingly at odds with the sentiments expressed in his captivity narratives? If he did, why? And if he didn't, why did someone create a fake? And so it's just a fascinating example of how you constantly need to sort of corroborate evidence and try to follow the historical trail, the detective trail in as many different directions as you possibly can to try to get at the truth of what the evidence is. Zara, when you were looking at this alleged piece of human skin, how did you react when you realized that it might actually be a piece of human skin? Well, I will say that I called it up because it said it was a piece of human skin. So I I braced myself, but the wonderful librarians at the Huntington were sort of horrified that I was calling it up and said, would you like gloves with that? And I said, I don't think I should because it's a little jagged. I might rip it. And they were just horrified. But I will say that as a historian, it was a moment in which First of all, you know, how cool is that to find these really unbelievably unique sources in libraries just stuck in a folder waiting to be seen? And then also just this very visceral response that history is full of these dramatic moments in people's lives. And if it is genuine, what must it have been like to be with Sullivan's army in 1779 with a piece of skin that you'd made into parchment writing on it, this horrific account? And, you know, on the other hand, if you're the person who's forging it, you know, what's your purpose there? And what I argue is that if it's a forgery, the purpose was an all too familiar nefarious one, which is to sort of shift historical blame for violence in the Revolutionary War off of the patriots and onto Native Americans, partly so that land could be dispossessed as part of the legacy of the American Revolution. So that in this case, Seneca Indians in Iroquois, an argument could be made for, you know, they were violent in the revolution, they committed these atrocities, and they didn't fight with us. So it's okay to push them off their land. But in either interpretation, I think it's a really wonderful reminder of how material culture provides a sort of visceral connection with the past that might be a little harder to get at sometimes with a document. It sounds like you never figured out which source really told, quote, the truth about the past, whether the document you read really was on human skin or it wasn't. It sounds like you have to draw two conclusions about it. Yeah, and which is kind of unusual because usually with a source, you can come down after enough research one way or the other. In this case, I'm dying to convince the Huntington that sophisticated DNA analysis is warranted. They've been wary of testing it because it's brittle. And so they've been afraid that it would damage the piece, which is understandable. But at the same time, technology has moved forward and it would be really wonderful to have some analysis done. Although even that wouldn't answer the question of exactly when it was created and for what purpose. So yeah, I lean one way or the other, depending on you know different thoughts that I I've had. But what's fascinating about this is that I think in either case, it tells us something equally important and riveting about the past. And that's what's great about history. It's not just black and white. There's often a lot of gray area. Yes. 
or in this case, flesh colored. <laughs> in episode 70, Jennifer Morgan told us how historians try to remain objective when they research the past. In Portrait of a Woman in Silk, you spend a lot of time trying to reconstruct the lives of Anne Shippen Willing, Robert Feek, Anna Maria Garthwaite, and Simon Julins, the four main subjects of your book. You must have felt like you knew them by the time you finished your work. Did this feeling of knowing your subjects ever threaten to interfere with how you read and interpreted documents and objects that revealed information about their lives? And if so, how did you maintain your objectivity as you read your primary sources? That's such a great question. And of course, ever since history became a bona fide profession with standards in the late 19th century, we've striven to be objective, right? That's one of our goals is that we're going to tell you about the past without letting our own subjective contemporary reality cloud our interpretation of the past. Jennifer Morgan is a historian whose work I greatly admire. And I think it's really important that she reminded us of that because she deals with issues that are, I think, hard to to maintain an objective point of view concerning at times, because thinking about how people were treated in the past at times, I think, can cause you to empathize in ways that make it difficult to be objective. In my case, you're absolutely right. Researching these lives and not only researching them, but, you know, digging as deeply as I possibly could, almost somewhat obsessively at times, to try to piece together the little bits of information I had about them to try to recreate a life and a personality and a worldview, it did make me feel close to them. I often refer to Robert Feek as my 18th century boyfriend, which, you know, if anyone who sees his first self-portrait, which is at the MFA Boston, will understand why I might call him so. But it is hard, particularly with Anna Maria Garthwaite, I found that as a woman who works in what is still a male-dominated field, in the field of the historical professoriate, that I often felt a sort of personal identification with her because she too was a woman working in a male-dominated dominated world. And that combined with the sort of intellectual allure of all the mysteries surrounding her did make me grow probably very fond of her. And so it is hard at times, but I do think necessary to try to retain your objectivity. But I don't think it's necessary to give up your empathy with people in the past. And in fact, I think that if you empathize and strive to understand people in the past in an empathetic way, it can actually make you a better historian. Do you have any tips for how to maintain your objectivity when you do empathize with one of your subjects? I always ask myself two things. I always ask myself, number one, could I and how would I footnote this thing that I'm thinking about this person in the past, right? If my citation is going to be something like, this is wildly speculative, then, you know, I might have to rethink it. But if I could actually footnote it with the reasonable, logical assertion as to why I'm coming to this interpretation about this person, then I feel like it might be defensible. The second question I ask myself is, I try to picture myself giving this as a conference paper and picturing perhaps somewhat grumpy historian attacking me on, you know, a very speculative, imaginative read of history and how I would respond to that. And if I feel like I could come up with a good, compelling response, then I feel like I'm on solid ground. If I feel like I would sort of stutter and, you know, say I wasn't sure, then I think I need to, again, rethink my interpretation. So I sort of imagine myself either writing or responding to a question as a test. It's time for the time warp. Normally, this is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. But in this time warp, we're going to let you use a time machine. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. No matter how many historical sources we have for the people, places, and events we historians study, we always have questions that the record can't answer. Zara, you must have questions about Anna Maria Garthwaite's life that you never found answers to. So if you could go back in time and ask Anna Maria Garthwaite anything about her life, what would you ask? so great. You know, every historian's dream is to have a time machine. So you can go back in the past. We know enough about it that we wouldn't actually want to live there, but it certainly would be nice to visit and have these answers to our questions given to us. So I love that you're allowing me to go back in time and talk to Anna Maria Garthwaite because her house still survives in Spitalfields in the East End of London. And I've been inside it. And when I was in the second floor drawing room, which was likely where she created her designs, I thought, wouldn't it be lovely if I could sit and have tea with Anna Maria Garthwaite and pick her brain? So I will do that now. Personally speaking, I would love to know whether, in fact, my analysis of her as someone who was concerned about female independence is accurate. So, for example, why did she never marry? What was her personality like? What inspired her to pick up this silk design career in her early 40s? It's not even like she chose to do it you know, from the start as a young woman. How did she learn to do these designs? These designs are, it's not just like sitting down and drawing a pretty flower. You actually have to understand the mathematical components behind 
setting up a loom behind the weaving process. If you don't draw according to the proper mathematical proportions, then your design in the weaver's hands might turn out really wonky and bizarre looking. So she learned this technical information. How? Where did she go to research these precisely realistically drawn botanicals? Did she know men at the Royal Society of London other than her relatives? She had male relatives there. And then aesthetically speaking, I'd like to know what was her favorite design. And then, of course, finally, I'd like to take something back in the time machine with me because I'd like her to design me a fabric that I could have made into a dress. Well, since we're in the business of making dreams happen with time machines, I suppose you could bring something back with you. That would be allowed. Excellent. Today was a special treat because not only did we discover how historians read primary sources, but we also received a sneak peek of Zara's forthcoming book, Portrait of a Woman in Silk. Zara, would you tell us when your book will be available and what aspect of history you're researching and writing about now? Yes, it should be released in September of this year, so September 2016. And I believe information is up about it on Yale University Press's website and also a bit on Amazon. And I'm very excited to see the material culture of the book, if I could say so. But I'm also excited to be embarked on my new project, which I gave a sneak peek at, I suppose, when I talked about the note written on human skin. And that is that I'm delving into what it does for our interpretation of the American Revolution if we approach our understanding of that pivotal time period in our American past from the starting point of material culture. And one of the really interesting things that I've found so far is that by looking at the objects, by privileging the material culture of the American Revolution, I find that histories that historians often separate for various understandable reasons actually come together. For example, that women's history and military history, I'm finding I'm talking about in tandem, which is very unusual. Most military historians do not engage with women's history and vice versa. But I'm finding that some of these artifacts that wouldn't necessarily show up in, say, the records of the Continental Congress or John Adams' letters to Abigail or something like that, a more expected, traditional, wonderful source, but one we're more familiar with, that these really sort of break down these barriers. For example, I've found a necklace a woman had made. Her husband was a Patriot soldier in the Battle of Monmouth and his leg was shot into with a musket and had to be amputated subsequently. He sent home the musket ball that caused the amputation and she had it made into a necklace. So I think that's just wonderfully evocative and again, visceral, albeit slightly grisly, way of realizing how ordinary Americans, in this case, this otherwise historically unremarkable couple from New England, sort of memorialized the husband's participation and the family's sacrifice, common sacrifice in the American Revolution. So so I'm at the beginning stages of that, but it's so far I'm uncovering wonderful things and I'm excited to see where it goes. How can we get in contact with you if we still have questions about how to read a primary source, a portrait of a woman in silk, or maybe about your new project? I do have a website. You can reach me either at zaraannishanslin.com or zaraannishanslin.org or since I've grown up with this name and I understand how challenging it can be to spell, much less say, you can also find me at the same website via professorzara.com. Zara Annis Hanslin, thank you for helping us explore primary historical sources and for giving us a behind the scenes tour of how historians read and interpret them. Thank you for having me. It's been really delightful to be part of one of my favorite podcasts. So thank you for making me part of your history. Historians read and interpret historical sources like detectives looking for clues. Like detectives, historians interrogate their sources by asking questions such as what do the words on the page tell me? How does the information revealed by this source relate to what I know about the person, place, or event I'm studying? Or why did the woman in silk choose to wear a dress with a floral pattern that would easily date her portrait? Historians try to remember that every historical source contains the intentionality of its creator. Thinking about why someone created a source, be it a document, object, portrait, or oral tradition, can often reveal a lot of information about the past. As Zara reminds us, we can also learn a lot about the past by looking for what information is absent from a source. It's often the information that is absent from a source that reveals the most about the person, place, or event we want to know more about. You will find more information about Zara, her book, Portrait of a Woman in Silk, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 084. Our behind-the-scenes look at how historians work is made possible by a partnership with the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. The OI offers many programs that help historians investigate early American history. In David Shield's case, OI support paved the way for his investigations not only of early American history, but also into how Southern farmers could reintroduce heirloom vegetable and grain seeds, vegetable and grain seeds with an early American past. For more information about the Omohundro Institute, visit 
benfranklinsworld.com slash OI. This link will take you to their website. And on that website, you'll find all the information you need about their great programs and a page with a complete listing of all the Doing History episodes. Finally, what objects or documents do you think the historians of the future will use to tell us about your everyday life? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in the listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.